think we should start. Folks, our next talk is by Ilya Volkov. He is my fellow colleague from Case. He is our customer success manager, and he will go give a talk. Well, this one. Please proceed. <laughs> hey, hey, guys. Uh, nice to see you, everybody here. My name is Ilya. I'm a customer success manager at Case, as it says here. And uh, today I'm going to present a bit of a controversial topic, a bit of a provocative title here. Do customers define quality? Do they not? That's what we're going to talk about today. But before we actually begin, I want to tell you a small story from my past, from the beginning of my career, actually, even before, it was really a long, long time ago, even before I have been in the technologies. And if any of you have watched Tarantino's Four Rooms, you probably get the reference. <laughs> I was working in the hotels, a uh, beginner service job, right? I was working night shifts. And I have worked in a variety of different hotels, fancy ones, small ones, big ones, huge ones. But in any case, one night I was working my night shift. Everything was going just fine. We had all the rooms booked, no rooms, no room to spare essentially. One more guy we're waiting for with this, with his room, basically the last room remaining for the day. And so eventually he comes over past midnight. Everything goes fine. I give him the keys. We walk to the room. I walk him around, show him around. Finally, after that is done, he turns around, looks at me with a sour face, very unhappy. And he says, why the hell is the bathroom so far from the bedroom? And to be honest with you, I was lost for words at that moment because a night at that hotel was worth about the same amount of money I was getting per month. So this guy being unhappy with, you know, the distance he has to work to walk from the bedroom to the bathroom, I didn't really have anything to say to him. <laughs> but as you can imagine, it taught me a very important lesson actually. And the lesson was that the clients can perceive the quality in a different way than we do, we who provide them with the product. And it applies not only to the hotels, of course, it applies to pretty much all the industries. But jokes aside, I will tell you about a different story. And let me set you into the environment first. Imagine it's New Year, New Year's time. You're going around doing errands, buying presents, great mood. The holidays are coming. And then all of a sudden you get this text. From the medical organization, you do your checkup set, you go to doctor at, and it tells you that you've got aggressive lung cancer. Probably your new year is gonna be ruined that year, right? Of course they apologized right after because the text message was sent mistakenly. But they have sent it not to one, not to a dozen, they sent it to thousands of their clients. So we can only imagine how many people had their holidays really ruined that year. And it was, it was actually this holiday season. So it happened Christmas 2022. <laughs> so it's a pretty recent example of how screwing up can really tarnish your reputation or your company's reputation. But even that's not the end. Have any of you guys heard of Theorac 25? <laughs> Anyone? Anyone? Show of hands, nobody heard. I'll tell you. So this one, this machine, it was produced by a Canadian manufacturer back in the 80s. And it was used for radiology treatments. So basically, it is using x-rays to treat cancer. Cancer is kind of a topic here today. <laughs> but what actually happened is this machine had critical flaws in it. And eventually, it resulted in several people getting overdoses of radiation. They were actually getting hundreds of times more than any safe radiation dosage. Three of them actually died as a result. And uh, when the following investigation occurred, it was determined that there have been quite a few procedural errors in the company that was producing the machine. First of all, uh, they have completely skipped the integration phase of the testing. So they never tested how the machine works. 
whenever they installed it in the hospital, they never tested how the software works together with the hardware. Whoopsie, big oopsie. Whoops. That's interesting. Sorry about that. Yeah, I got it. Apologies about that. Yeah, from this one. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. So uh, it was discovered, as I was saying, that uh, integration testing phase was completely skipped. Also, uh, any mistakes that the software system would provide to the end user. They have been either poorly documented or they haven't been documented at all. So the operator who works the machine, they actually didn't know what any mistake they're getting actually means. And that also factored into the fact that many people got overdosed. Uh, one more thing, uh, one more thing about this uh, that has been investigated is that the software team, the, the developers of the software, for whatever reason have been arrogant enough to think that the software was not to blame. So they have been, for whatever reason, operating out of a belief that the software system cannot be flawed. And so it cannot result in any overdoses. And having that knowledge and having that arrogance, they also told that to the end operators, the medical specialists who are working in the hospitals using that machine. But you might tell me, like, if I'm producing some mobile, you know, game killer, a uh, game, a time killer that people just used to spend a couple minutes on the transport. Do I really care about that? Do I really care that much about testing? And I can tell you that you're absolutely right. If your system is not critical, if you don't have to deal with people's safety, with people's health, or even with people's lives, then probably you shouldn't hunt every bug. You shouldn't be spending countless hours trying to figure out everything, every single mistake, every single flaw, every single defect. Instead, you should focus on releasing faster. However, when it comes to the critical systems, where you actually have to deal with those things, where you have to deal with people's health, safety, finance, then of course, the weight of the mistake and the importance of a mistake becomes much more critical. But uh, moving forward, what I'm telling you all that for, and now let me introduce finally what I do and what my job is. I'm a customer success manager at Case. At Case, we are building a test management system, a cloud one, and I'm the one talking to our clients the most. <laughs> so basically every single day, uh, I spend in talking to those clients, understanding their issues, discussing with them their problems. And uh, with all that, I actually want to tell you that whenever you hear a notion that is quite popular, I know, that the engineers should be talking to the clients or that the company actually starts having problems when the engineers lose touch with the clients, don't believe that notion. <laughs> I strongly believe that the engineers, developers, quality assurance engineers, should not be the ones talking to the clients. And if you have a manager who tells you that you should be doing that, probably you should think twice. I'll tell you a few reasons for that. The first one is that whenever you are talking to the clients, you almost inevitably have to deal with the criticism. So the people will come to you criticizing your solution. If it is something that you yourself have been working on and spent countless hours working on, put your life into it, it's very hard not to become defensive whenever you get criticism. And it actually takes quite a, quite a character to to learn to take that criticism. And not everybody has that. If you don't have that, probably it's for the best not to talk to the clients. That's why you need the client-facing teams, like me. I'm distanced enough. <laughs> I'm distanced enough from the product. So I don't try the code myself. I'm actually not that much involved in it. And that allows me to take that criticism and not take it personally. Again, because I am quite distanced from it. So that's the shielding part here, the filtering part. Also, the fact that I'm talking and talking and talking and talking to the clients 
just like my team does, allows me for this ability to filter. What I'm talking about is you wouldn't imagine how much irrelative feedback I got over time, how many questions about that actually were coming from the fact that the person did not understand the, the way the software works correctly. And so all that allows me to filter this irrelevance from the development team. If you had to deal with all of those things, probably it would be pulling you in different directions and your product in different directions. And finally, the enrichment part, the third part of it. It also is uh, something that your customer-facing teams can provide you with. Imagine yourself in a situation where you get a question from somebody, and it's the first time you get a question like this. Your natural reaction would be to investigate, to try to learn more about the problem you're being asked about, to find a solution. It might not be the best or optimal solution that you will find. But imagine, imagine yourself in the same situation here in the same question for a hundredth time. And you already had a hundred conversations before about the same exact thing. So you will be treating that question completely differently because it's no longer a question. You're you start to see patterns. You start to see the underlying problems that all of those people that you've talked with before also had. So that allows you to bring to your product team or that allows your customer facing teams to bring to the product team, to the development team, something with much more context around it rather than just a single piece of feedback. Which is why I believe that the quality assurance teams and development teams should work in close collaboration with the customer facing teams because your customer facing teams are the ones that have this wealth of knowledge about how your clients use the software, what kind of problems they have, and they can bring you that context that you can use to further improve your product. But my initial title of the presentation was, well, well do the clients define our quality or do they not? And the answer is actually both. So it is both yes and no. But I'll explain why it is both yes and no. And we're going back to this graph, back to this reverse. Why is it a yes? Well, at the end of the day, we're building our software for the people that use it. So they are the ones that know the problem. They are the ones that are going to be using it to resolve their problem. So who is the better person to ask for this information than our clients? But it is also a no because just like the beat up saying from Henry Ford goes, if I asked my clients what they wanted, they would ask me for faster horses. And so only you and your team has got in their mind those ideas that you want to implement into the product and your client might actually never be even aware of what they want until they know it, until you provide it. And once again, we come to this graph for the reason that it also very, very largely depends on how mature your company and your product is and also how many clients you actually have because if let's say you are in an MVP stage and just starting up a new company, then in fact, every single piece of feedback matters. Every single client matters. Everything they tell you is actually going to define your product down the road. And uh, at, at this MVP stage, you're actually learning your client rather than providing a ready solution. You're trying to study them. How will they use it? What they need, what their problems are. However, when we're going to this section where the number of the clients grow, or in any B2C, just like Pixar, for example, <laughs> whenever you said you have like millions of daily users, obviously you cannot focus on every single feedback here, on every single conversation that you have. So it is basically becoming a balancing game between what your clients want and what you can deliver and how much each of their elements of feedback, each of their individual elements of feedback matter in the bigger scale of things. Your company may be mature as well, established on the market, have a great solution, but let's say you have just five clients, major ones, they pay you big bucks. Then of course, every one of those five is going to matter and everything they tell you is going to matter much. So summarizing, what did I want to plant in your head? What kind of ideas I wanted to share with you to think about? Quality at the end of the day is matching our clients' requirements. Going back to those horror stories about the cancer, text messages, and the radiology machines, obviously none of our clients 
want us to, to have this software harm them in any way. So we should provide safety. But of course, not all of us work on those systems that can actually be harmful or have a potential to be harmful. Mistakes, however, can be costly. But again, it's up to you to understand how costly those mistakes are for your clients. If you're working on a critical system, then of course, every single mistake can count. If it's something that is less critical and you know, if you can tolerate a few bugs here and there, then of course you shouldn't invest endless money into hunting every bug and squashing it before release. Your customer facing teams again, their knowledge should be used for your product's benefit because your customer facing teams are the ones that have this wealth of knowledge about your customer's use cases and the problems they experience every day. And finally, it is your product. It is up to you to decide how much the feedback from the customers is going to matter, how much weight is going to have in shaping up the product, and what your clients can help you with in defining this quality. And with that, my presentation is over. So let's open it up to the questions, if you have any. Who wants to ask a question? You covered it all. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, how, um, how often uh, your filter uh, was uh, false positive or false negative? Uh, when you g get uh, customer feedback, uh, you try to analyze it and uh, how you ensure uh, you correct in your analysis? That's a great question. That's a great question. And it's also, I believe, is something that is and should be a product of collaboration. So it doesn't happen in a silo team. It doesn't happen in a single team. So the team, of, the team that is customer facing it can collect all that and see some patterns behind it, right? If you have the same problem rising again and again and again and again, it probably means you have some deficiency in the product and it needs to be worked out. That's the goal of the customer facing team to catch those patterns in the feedback and to deliver them to the product team so that they can be managed, they can be worked out. But in any case, if you see it's a critical issue, you report to the engineers. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. If it's something that completely breaks the experience mm -hmm. for somebody, it's something that needs to be... And he's going to be the first to test anyway. <laughs> Well, that's for sure, right? You, you try to reproduce what... Well, of course, yeah. of course. So in many ways, I'm also like this QA. first, mm -hmm. first frontline QA. Yep. Yeah. More questions? <laughs> he covered everything. He did. Apparently. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.